today. You're known as an international singer, songwriter, a musician. You started out in Luton as an apprentice with Vauxhall. Where did music come into all of this? It came in before that, really. Uh, uh, I was doing piano lessons from about eight years old. But uh, that was primarily because my uh, my mum's family, particularly my mum's side of the family, uh, her brother had been uh, in the Navy and he, he could blow a bit of harmonica, you know, so there was already a bit of, uh, the family used to love music, so I think it was, I could learn the piano, so I would play Roll Out the Barrel, you know, when the, the, the family get together. Um, but uh, so I had a few piano lessons and I uh, wasn't really getting on with it. Um, but then I did a little bit of guitar lessons on the, in the last year of junior school, just one year, and then I went to senior school and they didn't do anything like that. So, so I had a rudimentary knowledge of both, and uh, which gave me an, a kind of inside knowledge of, of uh, what made up a record. So I think by the time I was about 14, 15, and I was in the car with mum and dad going on holiday, and the records were, I was starting to hear them, were all these like 70s, blues and bands and things like that and all the island records and, and uh, I could differentiate between what the guitar was doing, what the bass was doing, how, you know, what made a record a record uh, and um, so that sparked my interest um, and I started to pick up the guitar again and play it a little bit more um, but um, then I thought I want to get into a band as soon as possible and doing the apprenticeship was a way of getting money to be able to buy a guitar and an amp and get started. Was your desire at that time to be in a band? Because obviously at some point you ended up getting a solo career, but you were the front man for Cat Cool, or the Cool Cats, Street Band, and then the Q-Tips. Um, you went through those points. Uh, what Did you decide that you actually wanted to be in a band? And where did it come to the point of where all of a sudden you knew you were heading into a solo career? Um, I didn't want a solo career. I didn't see that as part of it at all. I just wanted to be in a band. In fact, in uh, Cat Cool, I was a bass player for many years and I wanted to be the singer. Uh, they only let me have a little slot in the middle. Uh, uh, and uh, because the band had already got a singer and he was much more rock influenced than I was. But the guitar player whose band it was had a wide range and wide knowledge of music. Uh, he turned me on to a lot of stuff, actually, Mario. Um, so I think it piqued his interest that uh, I wanted to do some R&B stuff, you know. It was basically blues, a little bit of Bill Withers and things like that. Whereas the other stuff was like Zeppelin and, and th things like that. It's quite a curious mix even back then. And we, we had a brass section. How that quite fit in, I don't know, you know, with Zeppelin stuff. But um, yeah, so, but I always wanted to be in a band. Never thought about going solo. I just... What I loved was the bands that I liked, uh, I had a connection with, and I loved that idea of, I identified with them. They, they made, like most teenagers, made my life a bit easier to bear, you know? And uh, you listen to the words in their songs and things like that, and I thought, it must be great to be able to uh, communicate with people through music, and that's what I wanted. And you've got a soulful voice. You've, you're known for your soulful voice. Is that something that you, it just had, it just went that way. How does it work from a musician's point of view and a voice of where you want to head? Um, well, straight away I was more R&B than the, the, than the main singer that was in Cat Call and the Cool Cats. So that was already there. Uh, that was just, uh, I actually started listening to rock music. Um, as I said, the 70s bands, things like that, you've got King Crimson, Jethro Tull, you know, all, all the island record stuff, Mott the Hoople, you know, and, uh, but, and Free, uh, but these bands were listening to blues. So I got into blues and through that, I found um, soul music, Joe, uh, because a lot of the blues singers, they wouldn't talk about listening to blues singers. It was guitar led mainly. They said they listened to Wilson Pickett and Otis Redding. So I naturally went down that route. Uh, didn't get to use it because the first band I joined as a singer, street band was started off as a funk band and ended up as a rock band <laughs> so m I moved through genres anyway but then I went back to soul the first chance I got and um, you made it onto Top of the Pops at quite an early age didn't you <laughs> with what song? 
Toast. <laughs> Toast. Now, food. <laughs> food. It all comes back to food eventually. Yeah. Where did that song come from? Because you narrate most of your way through that, don't yeah. you? And obviously you hit Top of the Pops with that song mm -hmm. way before obviously you came to be known as Paul Young. Yeah. Uh, so this was uh, Street Rain started off funky and then we changed drummers who, uh, who was much more rocky, the second guy. And we got much more rocky and punk was around so we were starting to thrash a bit more. But then you'd also got Ian Jury and all that kind of thing, you know. And then you, we were here in reggae for the first time where people were doing what they called toasting, which is kind of the forerunner of rap, where they would be talking over rhythm. Right. And uh, so uh, what happened was the guitar player broke a string, uh, one of the guitar players, not the lead player. Um, and we had two roadies that were so inexperienced they couldn't change a string. And he had to go off and do it himself and we had to busk uh, and it just happened to be that night that the producer that was going to do our first album was in the audience who was Ian Jury's musical arranger and of course I'm talking over rhythm and Ian it's quite similar to what Ian Jury does and he loved it and he said we should do that for the b-side and um, I couldn't remember what I'd said or done uh, I just talked until the, the guitar player came back I did remember it was about toast. And uh, so we basically cobbled it together again on scraps of paper. I said, I remember saying this, saying that. I'll just put some key words down and I'll move around that. And that became the B-side. Then Kenny Everett played it and it became the A-side. Kenny Everett? Well, yeah, I didn't know Kenny that. Everett flipped it, yeah, and, and just played it non-stop until the record company said, we have no option other than to make the B-side the A-side. We were going, this is going to kill us, you know, and, they, and it did. So at what um, point, obviously CBS Records was your record label that took you on as a solo career for Paul Young. Mm -hmm. How did that actually come about? Um, so out of the remnants of st Street Band actually became a soul band for a while. When the lead guitarist went, up, went, to, went off, uh, he got married and went on honeymoon. So rather than cancel the shows, we turned up with a brass section <laughs> and and uh, learn a soul set. And I thought, oh, I like this, you know, that, that, this feels good. And so then he came back, but the band couldn't survive off that hit. Um, and uh, eventually they, they crumpled and uh, three of us stayed together and said, let's, do, let's go back and do that again. By which time it was beginning to emerge with Dexy's Midnight Runners and there was a, there was a resurgence of interest in mods and soul music in general. Um, so that was it really, and uh, the Q-tips was me getting back into R&B and, and soul singing and growing comfortable with it and discovering my style. And stepping forward from being in a band like mm. the Q-tips to stepping forward and becoming Paul Young. Yeah. Where did that take place? Uh, that took place because the, uh, we, were, we were signed to Chrysalis, but they saw us, I don't know what they saw us as, but by the time we'd done that, the, the soul resurgence only lasted a year or two. Then you had new romantics. So then they'd signed Spandau, so now they're in a new movement, new way forward. So we were kind of, we became the party band for Chrysalis's Christmas parties. And be, beyond that, I don't think they knew what to do with us. So we started to get their backs up a little bit. <laughs> and because uh, we were really annoyed with them. And, um, we heard that they were going to drop the band but keep me. So we found a mole inside the record company, a friend of a friend, and he said, look, at the next meeting I'll say, nothing's going to happen to that. I wouldn't keep the singer if I were you. Just drop the whole band. Because I was getting interest from other labels, my manager told me. And um, so, so they dropped the whole band and I was free to do a solo contract. Now, it wasn't within my scheme of things, but the tail end of the Q-tips, we split into two factions where half the band were writing very retro songs and the keyboard player and I were trying to move the band forward from where we were. So I'd got some stuff that the rest of them didn't like very much and I thought, I can try it out. And all, that's all I thought I was gonna do. I was gonna try it out. So your first big hit, Wherever I Lay My Hat, mm -hmm. 1983. I mean, and you just, it just rocketed from there, didn't it? I mean, you were, yeah. you were everywhere. I mean, mm. I'm going to probably show my age. I was 13. No Parlay came out. Mm. Um, 96 was your first UK number one album. Yeah. 
and you you just took to the world stage at that point, wasn't it? And you just took yeah. off. Well, th that was a weird thing, you know. It's like when, I mean, you always look at what other people have done. And I thought, well, Rod Stewart has been with the Faces, but he's, he's he made a couple of albums while he was with the Faces, so that was my plan, you know. Hmm. Okay, I'll uh, I'll try this new thing uh, on my own then and see where it takes me. But I still wanted to keep the Q-tips going because I still secretly loved being in a band. Um, but it didn't happen that way. You know, and my first album was my was my success. <laughs> I thought it would take at least two or three before anything happened. But uh, actually, I had such a big support from Capital Radio and Radio One, um, the BBC DJs back then, Mike Reed, Peter Powell, and things like that. They loved the Q-tips, so they gave me fair radio play. They that was when DJs had a fair amount of whack as to what they wanted to play. You know, so. So they really helped. Well, back in the 70s and 80s, the DJs kind of ruled the airways, didn't they? And the, yeah. How they approached, because yeah. they, they played the records. It's not like now where there's lists that you hear the same song to a degree every day, whereas mm. no. you know, they could almost say they what they did champion, and didn't. Yes. You know, yeah. A record of the week really was a record of the week, yeah. and they chose it. Yeah. And back in those days, you know, buying albums, you know, we, we bought albums, we bought singles. You know, I remember mm. going out and buying all of that. I remember buying yours. Um, and that, you know, it, it really stood to the part where it was top of the charts, you know, being number one and, and then your albums and how people bought that. How did you, you know, you, you went from almost being at the back to the front. How does that change your life? And uh, there's kind of two questions here as well. You know, being on the road, let's look at the likes of The X Factor and all these great mm. shows that are on TV and finding stardom. You trod the boards and you yeah. worked the motorways of the UK. Yeah. Has life changed from then? You mean the way kids are now yeah. and what, what they go through? They, uh, they go from the bedroom to the stage. You know, um, there's quite a few pe people that it's, it's happened where they've been a YouTube sensation without stepping out of the house. And then all of a sudden they've got to adjust to that quite quickly. Some of them do it very well. But the chances of longevity in that I think can be quite slim. I can't think of names that jump to mind at the moment, but the people that I thought, I, I saw them on YouTube and thought, they're amazing, you know, and, and then they they just arrive at a blaze of glory, but it's very difficult to keep that up. You know, I, I was raised in pubs and clubs, working men's clubs, and, you know, one when I was younger up in Yorkshire, we had live bands every weekend, so mm. um, uh, soul singers to bands of, you know, five or six, and you see them tread the boards and they were literally, you know, in the old Bedford van, the Ford yeah. Transit, with all their gear piling in. And they had a great night, you know, working, you know, hand to mouth almost. Yes, we did. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, there were occasions when I had to sign on and, and kid them that I was going to go and do a job interview. <laughs> that and type you never thing. did? No. No, of course no, not. Because it wasn't what I wanted to do, yeah. you know. Uh, and uh, I remember being on the road with street band. We couldn't even afford a Ford Transit. We had a comma van. Oh my God, little sliding doors. With sliding <laughs> doors and the engine cowling in between the driver and the passenger seat. And then the engine caught fire. So the whole thing started getting really hot. We had to pull over, steam coming out. We lifted up the engine cowling and fire shot into the, <laughs> into the van. We all dived out, you know. The ridiculous times that you, had you know, but yeah, we went up and down the country, and um, but I was learning my craft. And when obviously you hit the UK as number one, and then obviously you were you were going around, not necessarily travelling around the world, but on the global stage. How did your life change then, from a Luton boy to the next stage? I mean, that jet set life of from yeah, an apprentice to a superstar. Um, well, apprentices to superstar, that's a long way. So I've mentioned those no, things I know, yeah. that happened in street band and then Q-tips got a bit more professional. We worked solidly. I mean, we did so many gigs. We did something like 270 gigs in a year and made our first album. You know, we never stopped. Wow. Um, and um, so I got a taste for life on the road and I was ready for it when, uh, when the solo success started. I'd learnt how to be on a stage and, and if not get an audience in the palm of my hand. I mean, there were still other people I looked up to and thought, God, will I ever be that good? You know, you watch them 
and how they can control the crowd. So that was my aim, to be able to do that. And so um, I was lucky that I had the grounding once I became solo, to be comfortable at the front of a stage. If not, I wasn't comfortable being solo. That's why I gave my musicians a name of as the royal family, so I could kid myself I was in a band still, you know. It was that gentle movement from being as a part of a lineup to, to being the lead guy. And where did the name of the royal family come from? Well, because um, there was um, Prince around, and so it was a very regal name. And then there was another guy called Prince Charles and the City Beat Band. So I was listening to it. This is the stuff that I was listening to back then. I thought, this seems to be a very regal thing going on here. And I thought, but I'm English. We're regal. You know, so I thought that the royal family would, would work. Here. What a hell of milk from a hole in the roof where the rain came through. What can you do? 